to the system to say, all right, go here. So on the controller, I have this go to task, uh, go to method defined, and that will you know redirect to wherever it's supposed to go. So um, it kind of feels weird to see that here, though, because in your context, you'll have several objects have been extended with uh, with different modules, and let's say you have like a volunteer which says side go to task go to something and then you have a manager go to somewhere else how, <coughs> how does that work? It's like here it works because you have only that volunteer and he's kind of like the, the main actor doing something but you might have like, different uh, different objects both being like real actors uh, so here that, that kind of implies the volunteer is the one actually clicking the button on, yes. on the site right? Yes. Uh, that's that part where the, the volunteer is the one acting on the site is kind of implied by the way you're writing this, but it might be that you may want to reuse the same kind of logic when somebody else, so when it's, it's taken from another uh, approach, from another point of view, and by doing this in here, you're kind of binding this whole part of the logic to that given scenario and making it not reusable. Kind of the feeling it's, uh, uh, I'm not sure I fully understand, <laughs> and uh, I, I your, your domain may differ, right? The, the example is, okay, in your example you're saying you can just volunteer for a task, but if we also had the manager be able to assign a task to a person. Which is what I'm explicitly not allowing, right? <laughs> but if we change the requirements <laughs> for the system to allow it, just theoretically, mm -hmm. <laughs> then, okay, then you're saying basically if you change the requirements, then you would have to re. You might have, for, in that case, you might have an example where the manager takes a user and initializes this context, right? Um, but the site object that you pass in could be something else. I don't know. It's I, I haven't thought through that scenario. So there may be an argument where in that domain you don't want to have that. I like having it. Um, but isn't it obvious that you have to change this because this is the business logic? If you change the requirements, it's like a natural flow, right? right? Whereas you may not want to change the interface necessarily. So yeah, the, if if my controllers are just, um... I think I, I got a light bulb just went on. The big difference with what we're used to, like class oriented, like this would be like hard coded methods in our objects. And these would, these guys would be there always. Whereas here, the volunteer volunteering for a task is a context, a volunteer, right? But a manager assigning some uh, somebody to a task would be a different context. It's a different exactly. use case. Yeah. Exactly. So in that case, we don't have those methods. We we have a, a different set of methods for that context. Yes. Now you may you may reuse this. So you, that that manager may inside there initialize this context and you know select the user and pass that user in. Um, and so then you can reuse this because that's a procedure that you do care about. And then you may argue that, well, we don't want this here. You know, it doesn't make sense, and so we're going to change that and move it to another location. But for now, as I'm walking through this, this is what I care about. Um, I thought, these are the things that have to happen. So I'm just going to stick them all right here in this context. There's also the ar architectural implication that your controller is not your business logic. Your controller is not in control of this logic. It, all it is doing is controlling the access between your existing HTML based interface and your application as that's opposed right. to mm. that's right. business logic. So, so that's why you want to not have this in your control. One of the reasons I say this in here, I want to you know, tell this listener site to go to somewhere is that it may not be a Rails controller, it might be something else, or maybe it's a uh, fat client, you know, and I want it to repaint the screen to something else. Um, so I use terminology that's related to the domain that I care about. I want it to go to here. Um, so. Or it could be migrating from a standard Rails app to a backbone-based application or something, right? <laughs> I suppose so, yeah. <laughs> But what uh, what I really like about this is that I I just initialize. All right, sorry, I just start writing a class, and say this class is going to represent these things interacting. 
and I can just hack through it and read it. Because these things I know I want to happen uh, in this scenario, that thing, those things I want to happen in that scenario, and they're all related. Um, uh, I don't really have it here, but you know, if there were certain things that each of these tasks did, I could just stick them in a method and, and reuse that behavior in here, but that's what the volunteer always does. Um, and then here, this, for example, task, you know, the, the volunteer knows about the task that it is. So it's, this is where the method missing sends the message to context, and the context says, oh, here's the task that you're talking about. So how would you do the, uh, this kind of, I guess it's also supposed to be uh, available like in a deeper hierarchy. Like if you're going into a um, like a notifier or whatever, like right now you're passing in the task, but ideally that would be kind of available, right? No. So you wouldn't pass in the maybe the uh, currently you're passing them in, but maybe you wouldn't actually in DCI pass this in because the context is already there. So the notifier should already have access to the context, so there's no real need to pass in. Those as parameters. Oh, for for yeah, that's true. Or is it the queue method? I mean, it already knows which task because it's part of the context, right? Uh, yes. So this queue method doesn't exist. I just you know yeah added it right. Like um, there is more like maybe the high is coming in from somewhere else. So you kind of want to know like what what priority you want to put in the task, but the task is part of the uh, context, so. Yeah, so when I was walk when I was thinking through this, I thought, all right, the people who are going to work on these things, and then there are managers who just want to track something, right? So that's why I have watch task and select task. And the watch is a low priority yeah. queue, and the, um, the actually selecting one is a high priority queue. I still have no idea what the queue will be, but I know that in some way there's going to be some collection of things that you care about. These are very important. Those are not as important. So there's work that I have to do. I volunteered to do this work. I've got to get it done. There's work that I'm watching that's lower priority. So those are the terms that I chose. And uh, this helps me break down the business value uh, without worrying about implementation yet. Um, the notifier, I knew I needed to send email. So I just did Rails G mailer and gave the name. So um, there's probably a good. Um, argument to say that it might know about the task already, um, but I didn't. I guess it's, as I understood it from the last DCM meetup, that the context is kind of available within its, itself. So if you are within the context, you should have access to those. Yes. To the, to, to the context and with that also to the... Uh, All the actors inside the actors it, yeah. itself. So then basically passing around those kind of... Um, parameters becomes not so much relevant. Yeah, I suppose you know like this might become queue task, yeah. but I need to know what I'm queuing. Uh, my thought was maybe I'll be queuing other things on mm. as well. Um, yeah, so I can either pass it in or I can define a queue task yeah. method that uh, exists on volunteer. And, and because if you're just putting all the this logic here, then you could also just use forwardable, right? Uh, because you can't just write like Q task and just or then I don't see so much so much value in uh, using in extending the actual object if you're just calling. Well, it depends on how you're going to implement. If you yeah, if you have just all the implementation that, that uses those different methods that are available within the your first and within the kind of the first layer like in this module, then yeah, you could just like. Just forward it directly to that and get the value and then work with those. But if you're going deeper levels, then I'm seeing more value in that. Yeah, it'll yeah. depend. You know, if it's starting out, you may find that uh, by accessing classes right from it within here, yeah. um, it's easy enough to get going. But then as you reuse or as you dive deeper, then you know, putting them in other places might make sense. So, um, the uh, this is what I've done to uh, kind of get going writing some pseudocode, right? This I'll, I'll create an, uh, a context class and I determine this class's job is going to be managing 
this use case, whatever that may be. Um, if I have success paths, if I have failure paths, you know, if I'm unable to select a task here, I want to see what happens when I have too much work. You know, there's some sort of way to calculate you're already doing too much, you have failed on the last three sprints, so you can't select anymore, something like that. I want to know what happens here. And maybe that logic is inside another context, but I can at least see uh, the initialization, the calling of it, and what happens if it's good or if it's bad. One other thing, I guess, was what we discussed after the last meetup was code reuse and those kind of things. And I'd like to hear your opinion on that. Like, you you done some projects with DCI, and how was the code reuse there? Or the ability to reuse code? That is maybe coming from totally different contexts, but it's kind of still using the same code? Um, or it may require refactoring okay. your context so that you can change the way it's used. When I first started, I thought I'm going to make it as reusable as possible, and I would define these modules externally, and I would you know, assign them internally, and I found that I just had all these roles. I even made an app roles directory where I put all this stuff, and it just made no sense to me. I ended up just moving them back into the context where I cared about, because I would define behavior in one, realize the name that I had used was, like for example, if you have an admin, an admin may assign a task, right? But elsewhere, an admin does something else, and they're not related. They're only they only have the same name. They're not related at all. Um, so, I could have an admin module in here and an admin module in another one, and while they're the same name, they're completely different roles. So you would tend to then not reuse so much code, or not worry too much about it. I wouldn't worry too much about it, and I would try to reuse the context because it's again it's the okay. business procedure that we care about, and if this uh, is going to be the place that you're going to encapsulate the success and failure paths for your business procedure, then that's the part that you reuse. You just make sure you send in the object that you want. Any other questions? Have I convinced you to use this or not to? <laughs> so then what would your controller look like where you're actually uh, using this? Let's see. Volunteers controller. Uh, I should be a volunteer in some Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it could be, yes. <laughs> Again, wrote it today. So um, there's probably it's all, all kinds it's of things. All good. <laughs> Don't worry, John. <laughs> But yeah, so uh, the thing that putting it in that uh, other context class allows me to do is define completely separate uh, controllers uh, and use the methods that I want. You know, my, I may have multiple different creates because that makes sense to do a post or whatever. Um, or you know, if you want, you can do the non Rails way and have more than just create, show, whatever the seven methods are. Um, so it's, it's completely up to you, but you can decide that if you have it all in the same uh, location inside of context. I think I have a, uh, what's the other controller I have? The other thing that I started thinking about uh, today was, what if I had something that, that told me what are my options, what can I actually do? And it looked through all the contexts that were available to me and showed you here are all the things that you can do. You can select some work, you can take a vacation, you can do this, you can do that. Um, so um, I didn't really uh, write any code for that. But, so. um, I didn't. We have client user defined. Client user defined. Oh, current user? Device. Um, it's a kind of business logic. It's business logic, but it's not. Um, uh, so, actually, so. user is a very complicated 
Why, why would it be complicated to find the current user? Cause, uh, cause, there are many checking out, so uh, maybe they're not the same bots as other people. Maybe so. So, so actually, our application has uh, many, so many checking. So, like a uh, uh, session expansion. Uh, Browser checking or so. It's a kind of business logic to. For example, say you had support person, you wanted to find out the a user who had, you know, sent in ten support requests so far. For example. So user Those kind of conditions. User is a model. So. Uh, let's see. So here the benefit is. Um, when I was writing this, I assumed that it would be a, a single user. There's no complicated uh, logic about finding that user. It's just whoever's in the session um, and passing that in. Uh, this context could be used uh, for whatever other business logic, and you just pass that user in. So here, in this limited example, I know who it is, but if you have a complicated example where you know that a particular user is selecting this, you can pass in whatever user you want. I'm not sure if that really answers the question, but um, <laughs> authentication uh, or authorization is really tangential to what DCI uh, is attempting to cover. It's not really necessarily a way to uh, worry about habits of your application. DCI is an uh, attempt to cover use cases, full, full use cases. I guess one thing that he is maybe get, trying to get in, I'm not sure, but I guess you have some sort of data structure, right? But if we have now a different user that has a total different data structure, mm -hmm. how would you, so then you would need to, to write some sort of adaptation logic that adapts to, okay, if I'm actually having this sort of user, uh, for instance, if I'm accessing it over LDAP or whatever, mm -hmm. I need to access it that way. It maybe has total different like uh, how, how the opt or how the data is. It's not necessarily stored, but also how it's ac accessed. That sounds like an architectural problem and not a business logic problem. But it is CCI, right? Because you can say, okay, in this context, this object has to support, support this role, but how do I make sure that the role implementation can access the data that it is actually needing in order to uh, to, to fulfill this role. We have no compile in Ruby, right? So yeah. you could argue, well, if you're compiling it uh, So in, in the C++, language. you would restrict the roles to be applicable to certain roles? I can't answer about C++, but you might write a or test to have, cover that. But really, it's you know, you would want to write a polymorphic interface for the object. So wherever it came from, you don't want to have that logic in here. You just want to know that this object responds to those certain methods. Okay. Uh, Would that be then also a context again on the user? Um, or for for where it came from? Um, no, to to adapt it to the uh, to the to the interface that the task or that your your other. I doubt it. I mean, I guess that that's so. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> If you're if you're getting a user from your local Active Record database, or you're getting a user who logged in from Twitter or something like that, or from an LDAP uh, record, you would still write your application so that a user is a user no matter where it is. Um, and if, um, mm. but that kind of invalidates the thing that we have those. Uh, I love you're looking at a very different structure. concern. Huh? Like you're looking at a very different layer there. If you're maybe doing, I am. Maybe I am. Just, so, this, uh, yeah. like, it's about expression in that sense. In that, it's how you express your interfaces and objects and what kind of access mm -hmm. means you have. So, that's a little different from, like, DCI isn't meant to solve everything, right? So, I think the goal here is just to.
come down to when you've got the objects already, and you're just trying to deal with the interactions between those objects. And the complexity of the, say, LDAP will be covered rather by DC, I provide NVC, so you have a separate like, So you would write another user NVC. that has kind of the same interface. Well, a different type of controller, I guess, for a separate well, okay. connection. Well, okay, was just maybe a stupid <laughs> example. So I'm just like arguing, if we are supposed to kind of put in those, those different objects that maybe be here or store data in a, in a different way, uh, would we, Use DCI for that, or do we would use just that? It's used. Yeah, it wouldn't. I, it, I don't think DCI has an opinion on that. Okay. For example, Data Mapper would be a good example where you have two different data stores, and you want certain objects to have a particular structure. You could map them so to either store. Still, kind of, if we're talking about interface, like have a kind of an interface for the user is supposed to kind of expose and then write your. Uh, business logic basically to use this interface that the user exposes. And if you want to switch out the user to use something completely different, then the user just needs to implement that interface. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a this is a higher level. You know, doing a context. That's that's why I say I would start with this because I don't care what's there and it's easy enough to uh, even if queue. Um, you know, here I, I don't have anything that is actually queuing, even if that just calls save underneath and uh, it sets a uh, status of high. I, you know, I don't really care, but uh, at this level I thought, well, this makes sense to me. I know I'm going to have different um, uh, amount of importance on each one, so I'll just say queue. But where that goes, I don't care. Uh, what, I, what I was talking about at the beginning, um, you know, I would write stuff like this previously, and I would always be passing in, uh, I don't really have it defined here, but, you know, if I had an initialize method, I would always be uh, passing in here reference to the task. You know, if this was just def opt in, I would be passing in a task, and then I would have a, a task argument here, passing that in. I found it to be really cumbersome. It was it's what you're supposed to do, but uh, and I remember first seeing examples where uh, code was written that it didn't do that. I thought this is weird. Why would you? It makes no sense. Like nobody would accept. If I showed people to write code this way, no one would accept that. But as I've gotten through it, I realize I'm I'm passing these references all over the place. And if this context is just supposed to represent these interacting objects, well, they should have access to each other. So um, I find it a lot cleaner to read when I can just assume that this volunteer knows it's working with a task. So, so that way, you know, using, uh, what is this, I think this one, you know, method missing, just asking the context if it has that method, it's really useful. Do you use Cucumber? I do use Cucumber. <laughs> it just feels like very similar to me that you're having, like with Cucumber, you're having this kind of extra DSL mm -hmm. on top where you're going through the effort to define like some very high level of the business logic that you could communicate with about the customer. Right. And then you have this extra, but which is maybe a good thing, but the bad thing is you're having to implement kind of this extra Plane, right? Extra DSL on top of it, so it's a, an extra layer of abstraction over something like RSpec or whatever. I, I I just find personally, but it was kind of similar to me when I'm seeing your example here. That on the one hand you're getting this uh, more clean kind of business logic, and on the other hand you're kind of getting this extra overhead of this extra layer of abstraction, which is also in this example, at least, making it a bit more complicated to me. I guess there's also, also if you have redirects and if you have actually steps that are longer. Mm -hmm. So you're still kind of, I guess, it's still kind of found to be HTTP because you're kind of only looking at small things. But if I have like a, something that I don't want to, would actually want to execute in a background task or those kind of things, I guess we're not looking at that. I don't know how, how if how complicated that would make it that idea. If, if that's or so if that's important to your business logic, then I would put it in a place that you can see it. If yeah. if 
if you're implementing something for yourself or for a customer and they care that that happens, I would put it in one place so that when there are problems, you see what is there and what is not there. That's, that's what I gain from doing this. Um, I think you're right in that this simple example, particularly when we write Rails applications, it's really easy to just add these methods to the model and you're done. And, it's, and the controller is a lot simpler. You just kind of pass in some parameters and, and it's no big deal. Um, so, well, I, I guess it was just what I was seeing was in your example here, what you had in the context would normally be what I would put in my Rails controller. Right. There. Like, yeah, basically three method calls there. Right. Uh, and so, in this given example, maybe I'm not seeing the advantage so much. Though I do see sometimes I have the problem where I have just added a lot of methods to my uh, Rails model and you have these groups of methods that are really, you want to be able to group them together. And I guess I see the value in maybe using it in some cases. So when you're doing your applications, would you use DCI for everything or would you use it only in these cases where you see you can pull out these groups of things that belong together? Um, when I first started reading about it and playing with it, I was excited about using it everywhere. Um, Trig the Rienskog, uh, Rienskog, the one of the creators of it, along with Jim Copeland, um, says that wherever you have two or more objects interacting, DCI is a candidate for the design. And I think that's a great way of putting it. You can solve the problem in multiple different ways. You can solve it with DCI. Um, but it's a tool that uh, has certain benefits, and you have to decide. So. Um, I'm using it more and more, uh, and I don't know if that answers the question or not, but uh, I, I like it because I start with code. I don't start with tests, um, and I see what, uh, what I need first. <coughs> Feels like the, one of the key things is that you're separating the, like, um, non business domain parts from a business domain part. So if you're doing a Rails app, HTTP interactions and the controller, mm -hmm. well, they're, they're boilerplate, right? So these, using DCI in that case, having a context in between the models and the controller gives you a way to abstract out that exactly. layer. Yeah, you know, um, in Clean Ruby, I haven't gotten to that point, but I'm going to make the argument. And what I start doing is walking through the business log logic and showing you here's how we hook it into Rails and all this kind of stuff. And I, I have a chapter where I'm going to be pulling it out of Rails and putting it in Web Machine. If all we need is an API, maybe we have another option out there. We prefer a different framework. And we still value all the business logic. And if all of that is tucked inside of your controllers, then you either have to go and have your application controller that every controller inherits from do something that this new framework does, or you can just pull the parts out you want and dump it into the place that you need it. I feel like everybody is on the fence. Well, it's hard. It's, it's a new concept, right? Yeah. It's a new paradigm. Mm -hmm. I think everyone's learning. I, you know, I've heard people say there's a lot of boilerplate. And I've heard that many times, and I've never felt that way. I don't know if it's just that it doesn't bother me to do this, and other people would prefer not to, um, or maybe there's something that I'm not seeing. But uh, I, I think it's because it looks very similar to what we're already doing, for instance, in our controllers. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also adding a bunch more code. Mm -hmm. If you just look at like the simple examples here, right. And I think it's not until you get into really complicated situations <laughs> that it becomes right. more useful, but then that's hard to give an uh, example like this. Yeah, if you don't do your planning and understanding of how the system's supposed to work ahead of time, you know, and you're saying, oh, we're agile, we're just going to add stuff as we go, then you find that your architecture doesn't support the ability to change when you need to. But I actually, there's a, a mailing list called Object Composition, Object-Composition. Uh, that's a DCI discussion group. 
And when I first started reading about it, I asked that exact same question, like, isn't this the equivalent to my controller? Isn't this, aren't these contexts just, can it just be a controller method? And there's some back and forth on that, and includes my thinking, like, why can't it just be? And you could probably argue that it could be, but what is your controller supposed to be doing? Like, it's just supposed to be taking your request, initializing whatever object it has to be, and returning a response, right? That's really what it is, and I know that it can do a lot more than that, but uh, it's easier to understand your system if you pull out the business logic out of those methods and put them in a place that makes sense because not, uh, it's not just one single controller that represents a use case in your application. It's usually a couple of different ones. So if you can take all of that information and put it in a place where you can see it all together, then it's more helpful. You know, if it's just I'm creating a new user and saving it to the database, then putting that in the controller is fine. Just initialize that object and save it. I, I think maybe it's enough. also maybe Rails there and the way it's been moving forward is it Rails itself is already getting rid of most of that boilerplate code using response to and whatnot. So basically, you're left with almost empty methods <laughs> right. to begin with there. Have you, have you ever seen Dr. Nick's magic models? He wrote it like, six Neither. years ago, and he would basically read what was in the database and initialize a model for you so you never even had to write the, the, um, the file. You didn't even need a user file. It would just see that it had these relations and whatnot. And, um, and he did it as a joke, and everybody was excited about it and tried using it in their <laughs> applications. And until he finally, he, like, he stopped accepting pull requests, and he said, no, please don't use this. So. Um, yeah, you can go down that route as well with uh, Rails controllers if it's that simple and it just hooks into certain things. But. So, oh, I think the, the path for me for DCI would be more, I have these cases in my existing application where I have the complex interaction of a couple uh, objects and I've just pushed it all into one model for right. just to put it somewhere. The question and, is, does it belong there? Right? Is that the responsibility of your model? No, that's what I'm saying it's not. So I'm saying if, if we were to go through one of these scenarios where, okay, you have this existing Rails application, and here's you, how you can use DCI to extract this stuff and make it nicer, it might be easier for us noobs to kind of grasp onto that. Uh, I see. Right? right? Rather than presenting, here's DCI, which is like a totally different way of doing things. Yeah, it's... Um, so... The difficulty in that, it yeah. actually, I think, to me, magnifies the value of doing this, yeah. is when you have these classes with everything just shoved in it, yeah. how do you know if you pull methods out and put them into a context that something else hasn't called that method? All test cases. Test cases, yeah. As long as you have them, <laughs> which I know a lot, of, if, if a lot of people tend not to. If you're writing Ruby or Rails and don't write tests, Sorry. <laughs> 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 uh, I think Paul really has a point because um, finally today, I think, thanks to you, I really start understanding what DCI is all about. Uh, seeing like a few code samples, like the one with the initialize method extend. Oh, okay, so that's what we're trying to do. And then when we use it, uh, another code sample you have there, like, okay, do like the, uh, create the context, pass it some object, and call the method like opt in. Okay, now I understand this CI. And I actually spent uh, a large part of this talk in the, I had a background process that was like, okay, where can I apply this in, in my body of work I've had so far, like on all the systems I'm working on, I've been trying to think here and like, where can I actually use that? And finally, it just like went, uh, you guys know that, Wavelight. I'm like, that's perfect for Wavelight. Uh, we have a, a queuing system uh, for, for hospitals and clinics where we're moving people around between rooms and yeah it's exactly like that like first I had like big controllers I refactored that all into models so now the controllers are very thin and they just like push like buttons on the big black box that the models but now look at the models they're like mm -hmm. those huge files with like so many methods and interacting in like weird ways and actually the, the, the use cases are very simple it's like okay so 
somebody at the reception like presses a button and hands the, the patient a ticket with a number and then the doctor like calls a patient and then according to whether the room is full or whatever different things happen. But you probably can't like, see that anywhere. In exactly. The right. So I'm like, finally, it's like, this is an actual practical case where this will clean up my code. So my next question is, how, like, is it practical? Like, can I actually start implementing that tomorrow? Sure. Yeah. Okay, cool. So one of the things that I do want to point out is when, uh, I know when people start <laughs> People would start reading about the examples, they would see this uh, account transfer, right? And all the examples would have this execute method on, no, no, on the um, context. So people thought, oh, okay, I need to have an execute method that's part of the paradigm. But it's not. You, like here we have opt in, opt out. You just choose terminology that's relevant to the business use case. So if you do go and implement it, don't just assume that you've got to do certain things. And I think I've shown that here. You just Pick what makes sense, what is actually happening, and find those methods so that when you read it, you understand the domain. Yeah, I think having slightly more complex example would, would help. Yeah. Because again, like seeing like just the council, like, okay, it's like seeing Hello World, like, so what? Yes. But having something like, I don't know, like real, real life. Uh, I think that's the main thing that's. The is this why you say buy my book? DCI. <laughs> <laughs> it's still relatively new. So, like, all the experience with real-world application, applications are still kind of missing. And it's still not that supported by, by Ruby or any other programming language that you can actually very easily just go in and use it. Uh, so you still need those kind of helper constructs, right? right. Um, but yeah, I hope that Ruby will maybe be one of the languages that kind of does support it. No? <laughs> ah, there. <laughs> I think um, they're looking for new Ruby committers. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, I already have two, no, okay. Uh, anyway. <laughs> I have one last question, which is, so you mentioned that Ruby, like with the uh, refinements, mm -hmm. doesn't do totally DCI. Refinements let you override the whole class, but you right. need to do that only for an instance. Right. Um, that's more a question for all the Ruby committers here. What, what would be needed to implement DCI properly, I would say, in Ruby? What, what do those guys? I think we just work using instances. What's your wish list? I don't know. Um, I wanted to dive in and see if I could uh, help contribute that, but I don't know C, so I have to learn this. I hear the Ruby C is very easy. Uh, it's a little easier than <laughs> almost there. Yeah. One, one, maybe also challenging question is. How would you handle views in that sense, or parts of views, or I know it doesn't necessarily maybe has to do so much with business logic because we're talking about logic, but I think in the Rails world, lots of stuff yeah. also <laughs> has to do with views. Um, so uh, you, currently, I haven't seen any example that kind of tries to pull into. The views yeah, as I don't. Well, I don't have it here. The, James Ladd is a developer down in. In Australia, I don't know where he is in Australia, but he's working on um, Redline Smalltalk, which is Smalltalk implemented on the JDM. But he has this idea called uh, East Oriented Code, where uh, what you do is uh, if you apply a compass to your code, there's north, south, east, and west, and you should always get the program flow to, to go east, where you don't ask for value. It's kind of like ask versus tell, right? You don't ask for a value and set it to a variable and then do things with it. You always tell an object to do something. Um, so that's not necessarily related directly to DCI. I talk about that a bit in Clean Ruby, where you would want to actually print the results of something onto some sort of template. Um, and uh, I think Rack isn't quite, or Rails isn't quite built the way to do that. But uh, yeah, so it's not directly related, but you could attempt that. Always tell uh, the receipt. By the way, did you plan to have anything, anything sort of after this, after this part of the code? No. <laughs> I just check. No, I don't have grand finale. <laughs> I thought you might have a big surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Next time.
Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. I forgot to mention coupon code. Oh. Uh, raise your hands who you don't have Queen Ruby. Oh, you want to buy it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah? ah, okay. So I will tell you the special coupon code for this meetup. It's more discount 